So uh, we have limitation in technology apparently because uh, I talked over five minutes and so the uh, cell phone was unable to complete the uh, recording. Uh, anyhow, uh, so what I was talking about was kidding, uh, selecting your kidding time because you're not selling to the weather market for show weathers, uh, you're able to focus on the meat market, uh, which is uh, uh, in the end what we're all producing is meat goats. So I talked a little bit about the uh, fertility of these does. Uh, generally, on the first kidding, about half of them will single, and then the other half will twin. And uh, the goats, uh, they'll look like they're not feeding these kids a lot because they'll feed them for 15, 20 seconds and then they'll hop away from them. Uh, but the milk's extremely rich and they feed them a lot often, more often during the day than a boar. Uh, they don't have massive bags, but that's good because they're not going to break down in the other uh, as easily as a boar might or some of these other uh, larger bagged does. So uh, anyhow, uh, they have enough to raise two kids for sure. Uh, the uh, does are always one in one. There's no such thing as a fish teat in a Spanish goat, uh, a true Spanish goat anyhow. And so you don't have to worry about uh, a problem that is uh, uh, prevalent in the boar goat industry. So uh, the doe, uh, they uh, will breed off season because we've successfully implanted embryos in them and then uh, in uh, the non-typical breeding season. Uh, they, uh, I guess we may be in 10 years have had three or four that haven't bred the first year. I mean, and I'm talking in 10 years. Uh, I have one out there right now that she didn't breed, and I'm probably just going to send her on down the road because uh, just no reason to keep her when everything else breeds so quickly. Uh, okay, the uh, talked about the mothering ability, the kidding efficiency. How about the feed efficiency? Uh, my comparison or my benchmark is a boar goat industry kept records for a lot of years. In the boar goat, uh, it cost us with uh, approximately $330 a year to keep a full blood boar doe for the full year. And that includes pharmaceuticals, and warmers, you know, any sort of uh, antibiotics you might need, and uh, then the feed. And, you know, for a boar doe to stay in the condition that she's going to be marketable to the people that we were selling to, you got to feed them. A Spanish goat typically is going to cost about $150 to keep for a year, all in. You're rarely worming them. You might catch one up and worm it if you see that it got some rough hair coat. Uh, you'll do the Fomancha test, check the eyelid to see if uh, uh, it's not pink. If it's white, then you want to go ahead and worm them. Uh, truthfully, we catch them so few times that if I, have to, if I think a goat uh, might be, uh, uh, have a parasite load and I go to the effort of catching them, I'm probably going to go ahead and uh, worm her just because I have my hands on her. But uh, we don't do it very often on the mature goat herd. Uh, rarely. It's just when we see the hair coat starting to uh, maybe look a little off. Uh, the kids, when we wean them off, we will worm them. And then on the uh, first time does that we uh, are breeding, we'll breed or we'll worm sometime before breeding season. And then uh, likely after we uh, wean the kids off, we'll worm them again because they've, they've been pulled down. Uh, we breed fairly young, so. Uh, uh, you know, in a boar goat, you maybe you wouldn't breed as early as we do the Spanish, but we're trying to get production. So we want them to spring back as quickly as possible for two reasons. We want them to breed back quickly, and then also we want them to resume their traje trajectory of uh, frame development. And so we need them to turn fairly quickly. And if they've been had two kids on them, they're probably in a decline. Uh, up to the point of weaning, and so we got to turn that around fairly quickly. So uh, anyhow, that's the feed efficiency issue. I will say, if you're shooting for, a, say, example, a 60-pound kid to uh, go to the market, uh, on a boar, it was pretty easy, uh, a full-blood boar, pretty easy to do that in three and a half to four months. And, I mean, honestly, oftentimes uh, we would wean kids off at 55 to 60 pounds. And uh, you know, two and a half to three months, uh, just because they honestly they they naturally 
uh, carry more muscle than the Spanish goats. Now that being said, in four months I can produce, oh, what do we do, the last group I sent in uh, was about a perfectly matched group of buck kids. Uh, in four and a half months uh, they made 61 pounds. Uh, I fed them 50% corn and 50%, 17% pellets. I could have done better. I could have moved them along a little bit faster if I'd have fed them just pellets, but it was no need to. I had a certain uh, date that I wanted them to go to market on to hit one of the uh, uh, particular holidays, that the uh, an ethnic holiday, and so I knew where I had to be by then, and I knew I could get there by feeding that particular mixture. We've not, made, of course, maybe some of you are sitting there all aghast saying, oh my God, corn, you fed corn to bucks. It's not been a problem for us in the um, Spanish uh, goat. We don't find that they develop stones. Now, I'm not going to say they ne that it would never happen. It just hasn't happened to us. And uh, so anyhow, that's, uh, that's the feed efficiency. I'll say one thing. A lot of people think that, all right, Spanish goat, they're skinny little goat. Uh, perhaps they won't uh, grade as good as a boar. Uh, we take, when we take our goats in, there are literally people lining the fence because they're so impressed with the muscle and mass that these goats will produce. Now again, are they as muscular as an excellent show weather boar? Uh, no. But will they top the market? Yes. Uh, they're going to grade number two, with where, where, which is where 99% of the boars are. To get a number one grade goat, that's essentially uh, one of the better weathers out of a county fair that they group them up and, and they might be number ones. But number two is where most of them are going to fall at, and that's where these Weinheimer Spanish are going to fall at. So they're going to grade number two, and I know this because we go down to Richmond and uh, 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 Bowling Green, Kentucky, those are the two graded sales that are closest to me, and it's worth the drive, truthfully. So, um, all right, a little bit about the buck, uh, the, the boar buck, or not boar buck, the uh, Weinheimer buck. The Spanish buck, I guess I'll talk about a little bit in general. The Lot 69 buck bred in two months a pen of at least 70 head of uh, does, ranging from age 5 down to uh, 2 year olds. He bred all of them in two months. When we turned him out in the pen, he was 8 months old. So uh, try that with a boar buck and you'll see what you get. He'll breed one or two and then he'll go lay down in the corner while the goats mob him. So uh, anyhow, uh, they're uh, they're driven, uh, have a, a tremendous drive, and uh, these older does beat the crap out of them, but that don't stop them. They're like the Energizer Buddy. They just keep breeding them as they come in heat. And they don't fall in love with just one doe. They'll breed that doe a couple times, and they'll go find another one. And you can imagine in a pen of 75 or 80 does, there was plenty of does in heat at multiple times. So uh, that's just a little comment about how uh, these bucks are. They're going to go out and they're going to work. Uh, you'll look at that buck. He probably bred, he might have bred one or so in the last month, but they've all been pretty much uh, bred for over a month. That buck has sprung back nicely. Now, did I stun him a little bit? Possibly. I don't really think so because he's smarter than that. He's a Spanish buck. He's not a boar buck. Uh, when I put feet up for uh, the, that particular group of goats, he came and ate. He didn't worry about breeding a doe when, there was, when it was dinner time. So, uh, uh, yeah, he might have been a little bit more, but he didn't fall off bad. And you take a look at him. I mean, uh, I'm not feeding these like you would a, uh, a boar. I'm not trying to get them rolling fat. I want them to survive. I want them to be in there, basically in their fighting clothes. And I think that's just about where he's at. So, uh, all right. Now, why the Weinheimer? Uh, the Weinheimer goat, Spanish goat, is, uh, again probably the largest Spanish breed out there. And uh, we needed size, so that was a natural uh, way for us to gravitate. Also, I personally like to raise goats that have some dimension to them. I don't like a slab-sided goat. So I'm going to raise what the hell I like. Uh, 
I think the market will appreciate the goat as well. When you look at these does, uh, you're going to see that they have some width between their front legs. They have some width in their pelvic region. All of that equates to uh, dimension in the loin as well. So if you think about what we're trying to produce, we're trying to produce, you know, a meat goat that has, that's flesh as well, that has uh, uh, some capacity to produce uh, uh, significant amounts of meat in the high value areas, and the highest value area is the loin. So that's why I appreciate a wide base goat, because almost always that equates to a wide top, and a wide top equates to some dimension mm -hmm. in the loin, and uh, so I think that that's one of the reasons why these Weinheimers are probably a little better than most other Spanish goats and maybe, in my opinion, better than some of the other uh, true meat goat breeds out there in that they, uh, you know, they're able to, uh, uh, with relatively uh, minimal amount of feed, still maintain their frame and produce kids that have the same dimension that they have. So... Uh, uh, I want you to take a look at the sale offering. You know, a lot of people think that we're crazy, and I agree we are crazy because we raised boar goats for 12 or 15 years. But uh, the transition to these Weinheimers has been actually a very enjoyable part of the goat, uh, uh, of, the, of our goat experience, if you will. Uh, we get up there. Are they white-bodied, red-headed? As a general rule, no. Uh, but when I look at them, I know what they can do. I know that they're going to be trouble-free goats. I know that they're going to produce uh, highly valuable, highly marketable kids that the market's going to appreciate. And I feel better about what we're selling through the sale when I know that somebody new to the business coming in buying these goats, they probably aren't going to have a bad experience. Oftentimes with the boar goat, people's pocketbooks might run ahead of their knowledge base. And so they'll get a goat that maybe they, is really a, a has superior, fe, superior phenotype, but maybe they don't have enough knowledge on how to keep that goat alive. So, and that's, you know, I've seen that a few times and I've had people call disappointed because they've lost a goat. And, you know, I don't see that happening with these Spanish goats as long as you have a little bit of sense about uh, keeping uh, water to them and feed some and good hay to them, or even poor quality hay if you're going to push a little bit of corn or, or pelleted feed. So uh, the Weinheimer is a, uh, a f I think I say in the, the last email blast, a fiercely independent, uh, a, gr uh, 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 a, a wonderful mother. I mean, I, I go through several, I guess they call them adjectives, but I go through several descriptions of why they're just a wonderful goat. And I'm here to tell you that they're everything I, I just told you they are. And uh, now are you going to sell weathers to a, a fair? No. But what you're going to do is you're going to be able to go out there, see a highly productive goat. You're going to have minimal inputs into that goat. And I don't know, I guess Pam's giving me the eye, so I'm probably supposed to uh, wrap it up here. But I'll close with just saying, if all of you that have been reading The Goat Rancher for a number of years, Dr. Frank Pinkerton... Uh, had articles in there talking about a feed efficiency, and he talks about the savanna, he talks about Kiko, he talks about Spanish, and then he talks about the boar. And you can see an underlying thread throughout uh, his discussion. If he didn't come right out and say it, he's basically telling you that as far as efficiency and fertility and all of the things that go into making an excellent meat goat, the boar goat's not high on his list. Doesn't appear to be anyhow. Uh... But if you think about all the things that he tells you that you should be looking for, it's in the Spanish goat. And you're not going to pay $1,500 or $2,000 as a general rule for an excellent Spanish goat like you might a Kiko. And I mean, I'm not here to rip on Kikos. They're a tremendous goat. And uh, if they weren't $1,500 to $2,000 for a good one, I'd probably have some. But I don't think uh, the uh, normal Kiko is as good as these Spanish. And... Uh, just myself, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I don't mean to offend any Kiko breeders because I know that you guys are having great sales, great production, but for a meat goat producer, these Weinheimers are the future. So please really evaluate the offering. If you got any questions, don't hesitate to call me. Uh, 
or Pam. We love our goats. We know our goats, and we're willing to talk with anybody about our goats. Thank you very much.